Now, as far as Castro's rule was concerned, there was no, there was no democracy in Cuba. Instead, the state was the only game in town, and Castro hoped to incorporate people into the state by tying the goals of the Cuban people with the goals of the revolution. So in order to tie people to the state, in order to support, in order to win support for the revolution, he organized committees for the defense of the revolution, which included up to 800,000 people. Right, militias, which included 300,000 people. The Cuban Federation of Women included 376,000 people. All of these organizations incorporated the people, but in a role that was subservient to the state. Nevertheless, there were advantages to be gained. The Cuban Federation of Women, for instance, offered scholarships and trading. Right, Women who had been trapped in careers as domestic servants before the revolution could now go get training and pursue a new career. I've already mentioned the education campaigns where middle class people from the cities with a college education were sent out into the countryside to both educate and teach the people how to read, but also to sort of propagandize them and incorporate them into the state and to earn their loyalty to Castro's new government. All of these efforts were meant to subordinate the people to the state, but they were also meant to inspire support for the revolution. And as we'll see in a minute, support for the revolution was very enthusiastic, at least in the 1960s. Don't be confused, because nowadays Cubans are much more um, skeptical about the revolution that Castro engendered in the, 18, in the sorry, 1950s, but at least at the beginning. Most people were very enthusiastic about the revolution, and if you weren't, you were kindly asked to leave. Now, let's put this revolution into its larger context. The Cold War context has to be taken into account to fully understand the ramifications, the effects, and the consequences of the Cuban Revolution. Cuba embraced communism as relations with the U.S. deteriorated. They also moved closer and closer to dictatorship, right? The Cold War is a way of describing the world that emerged after World War II as the powers that had dominated the global economy and politics before World War II generally faded as a result of America's growing power and the Soviet Union's growing power. Despite the fact that the United States and the Soviet Union had been allies during World War II, an ideological rift divided them after the world. The United States represented the so-called free, capitalistic world, and the uh, Soviet Union represented the so-called enslaved, at least as the United States called them, communist and socialist world. This was an ideological cleavage that really influenced world history for the next 50 years as both the United States and the Soviet Union vied with one another and tried to win the support of people all over the world. As a result, when people, when, when revolutions or wars broke out anywhere outside of the United States or Russia, both sides generally became involved in trying to win them over to their side, to win them towards the capitalist side of the, of the world divide, or towards the communistic side of the world divide. Now, Castro was increasingly moving towards communism, and Castro was also increasingly moving towards dictatorship. And in fact, Castro was dismissive of democracy, which he referred to as, quote, the dictatorship of the capitalists. But, you know, one of the things that Castro had hoped to do was to free his country and perhaps the rest of Latin America from subservience to the United States by nationalizing all these lands which had been owned by American companies it was clear that the the Cuba part of the revolutionary goal was to break its dependence upon the United States this was this was also important because it was very clear to Latin Americans by the 1950s that the United States was no friend to re reform minded governments remember that the United States had helped support the ouster of Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954 because he had proposed socialistic reforms which would have taken the land from the United Fruit Company and given it to the people. Um, furthermore, the United States really did nothing to st stop the supporters of Batista who had left Cuba and carried out independent air and sea raids from Florida against Cuba as early as 1959. 
it is clear that the United States was no friend to the new Cuban revolutionary regime. And in 1960, the Soviet Union, seeing an opportunity there, dispatched an ambassador to negotiate a loan to Cuba. He took that loan and started to ally with the Soviet Union. This anti-American context served Castro well, however, because so long as the United States remained an enemy to Cuba, that could unite the Cuban people in their defense against this outside aggressor. And of course, nothing represented the United States' intervention in Cuba better than the Bay of Pigs invasion, or Playa Giron, as it's known in Cuba. In March of 17th and 1960, the United States began recruiting Cuban exiles for a planned invasion of Cuba. Now, this idea was based upon the invasion of Guatemala, which had overthrown Arbenz in 1954. And in April of 1960, Kennedy moved the force to Nicaragua to continue training them. This force, made up of Cuban refugees who had left Cuba after the Castro um after the Castro regime had taken over, was intended to, first of all, set off a popular uprising. They would invade, and people would see the invasion, they would recognize them as liberators, and they would rise up in defense of their country against Castro. Actually, not that all that different than Castro's invasion of Cuba in 1957. The idea then was that they would set up a Cuban government that would wage civil war against Fidel Castro. So this Bay of Pigs invasion was you know, about 1,400 people who were mustered into the militias and then sent to Cuba to invade it. Castro, however, was ready for the invasion with a 200,000-man militia and before the invasion ever arrived, because, of course, Castro knew about it. Those Cubans in Florida had talked about it too much and word had leaked back to Castro that an invasion was imminent. Castro had gone ahead and arrested about 100,000 people in Cuba of questionable loyalty. So when the 1,400 invaders arrived at the Bay of Pigs, they were 1,100 of them were captured. Why were they unsuccessful? Because Castro was much more popular than the United States had um, thought they would be when they, in, when they helped engender and helped plan for this invasion of Cuba. And of course, the United States, because they sent Cuban exiles to do their dirty work, they weren't explicitly involved. This is why the United States did not send air cover to help their landing at the Bay of Pigs. Had they sent planes to bomb the beach before they arrived, probably they would have met with more success. But nevertheless, they were defeated by Castro's overwhelming force made up of many, many, many enthusiastic young militia volunteers who defeated the 1,400 invaders and captured 1,100 of them and then ransomed them back for medicine and food. The Bay of Pigs was a tremendous embarrassment for the United States and the Kennedy administration in particular, it also had the, fact, the effect of uniting both Cubans and Latin Americans brimming for change, who hoped to break the dependency on the United States and to break the imperialistic goals that the United States had, express, had, had pursued throughout Latin America. And that the little island nation of Cuba had been able to defeat this force, which was clearly sponsored by the United States, made for great copy. It was a very great, it was a great story of a David versus Goliath sort of story where the small country of Cuba was able to defeat this giant force sponsored, trained, paid for, and equipped by the United, Spa the United States. And it inspired attempts at reform and revolution throughout Latin America for years. Now, the United States, which was more or less openly at war with Cuba at this point, then put a trade embargo in place. They severed dom diplomatic relations with Cuba, and they banned travel to Cuba. But none of this could combat the example that the Cuban Revolution had set. It was inspiring all across Latin America that Cuba had stood up to the United States. And remember that every country in Latin America had a symbol of U.S. imperialism in their country. The United Fruit Company in Central America and in Colombia, the International Petroleum Company in Peru, Anaconda and Kennecott Copper in Chile, the Canal Zone in Panama, all of these were reminders of the United States' overbearing influence over Latin America, which had only grown 
over the course of the first half of the 20th century. Nationalist politicians all across Latin America had long fulminated against the United States, but they had seldom acted. Now, Cuba, in blaming the United States and, you know, and, and painting the United States as their gravest enemy, is able to unite the Cubans in this regard. And, you know, over the course of the next 50 years, whenever it looked like relations between the United States and Cuba might begin to thaw, Castro does something to sort of subterfuge that thawing of relations. Um, for instance, in 2016, when Obama was president, uh, Castro shot down a couple of planes that were dropping pamphlets for the brothers to the rescue. When he shot down planes, which were manned by civilians who were merely involved in political activity, that forced the Obama administration to retreat in its overtures towards normalizing relations with Cuba. As long as Cuba has an enemy in the United States, that, help, that has always helped unite the people behind Castro. Uh, Cuba is always seen as a state of emergency, and any in the United States could always come in and disrupt their sovereignty and end their independence. And any criticism of Castro could, or call for elections could end up in a jail sentence because Cuba imagined that they were in a constant state of war against the United States. In fact, again, you know, Cuba, uh, sorry, Castro used this imminent threat of the United States to hold on to power. You know, as long as a war is going on, we need to remain steady at the wheel and have consistent leadership. So anyone who questioned the, um, question the regime of Castro was often seen as a traitor, as a, as, a, as a sort of spy for the United States within their midst. And in fact, in April of 1961, up to 100,000 people were in jail in Cuba for questioning the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. Another thing which we should probably mention here is that even though Cuba was cutting its ties to the United States, it was becoming increasingly dependent upon the Soviet Union, right? When the Soviet Union falls in 1989, that really brought on a period of irreparable decline in Cuba. And in fact, the Soviet Union stepped in for um, the United States and started buying up all that sugar that the United States had bought before. So in no small way, Cuba shifted its dependence upon the United States to a dependence upon the Soviet Union. And, and Cuba continued to be a sort of junior partner to the Soviet Union. In fact, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the Russians installed um, missiles in Cuba, pointed at the United States, when Russia ultimately withdraw, withdrew those missiles from Cuba, um, the Cubans were never actually consulted. Right? So the Cubans... Even as they cut their ties to the United States, they strengthened their ties to the Soviet Union, and in no small way, um, and in no small way, just shifted their dependence from one country to another. Such is the Cuban Revolution, right? But not only is the Cuban Revolution important for its own sake, it's also important because it had a tremendous effect all across Latin America. Cuba fomented revolution throughout the rest of Latin America. And, act, you know, the, the, the fact of it is, is that we see more and more revolutions afterwards. The unrest set off by the Cuban Revolution was probably greater than that which occurred in the wake of World War II or during the Great Depression. The Cuban Revolution was scary to landowners all across Latin America in a couple of ways. The rural masses expropriated land and asserted themselves in national politics through revolution. Now, there had always been peasant unrest in Latin America since independence during the 19th century, but also Emiliano Zapata in Morelos, Mexico, La Matanza in El Salvador, where peasant uprisings had been put down brutally by the military regime, and most re recently an uprising of peasants in Bolivia in 1952, which had resulted in a new revolutionary government that carried out quite a bit of land reform. But prior to the Cuban Revolution, rural revolt tended to be more local in scope. It was also politically unsophisticated. Think back to the Camnudos Rebellion in, in, in Brazil or the Tomoshik Rebellion in Mexico. Both of them were uprisings by peasants who wanted more land, but they were politically unsophisticated. They didn't have the sort of ideological or intellectual ideas of socialism or communism backing them up. 
The idea was just that peasants were treated unfairly and they were often suffused with religious movements which inspired them as much as anything else. What changed this? The transistor radio. We already talked about the power of the radio to unite large, na large national Latin American audiences, but the radio was still somewhat expensive and unaffordable to people who lived out in the countryside. The transistor radio, which became more widely available in the 1950s, was cheap and just about anybody could afford them. So what happens is that these movements become even more international. People all across Latin America were able to hear about the exploits of Castro, the way that the Cubans had stood up to the United States and won their independence. They broadcast the message of the Cuban Revolution and its charismatic leaders, the so-called Barbudos, to the largely illiterate rural populace of Latin America. As a result, peasants became more politicized, they became more aware of world events, and they became much more important in national politics as well. In Brazil, peasant leagues gained large land, owner, land memberships. In Peru, inspired by the messages of the Cuban Revolution, peasants began invading land all over the country. Socialism reinvigorated these rural revolts, which had existed in Latin America for at least 150 years by this point. Fidelismo energized the Latin American left. Now, the Communist Party had long existed in Latin America, but the Communist Party was largely seen as corrupt, as part of politics as usual. In fact, the Communist Party had been legal in Cuba before Castro ever got involved in, in this revolution to overthrow the Batista government. But the thing of it is, that was old-fashioned communism. This new socialism and communism represented by Fidel Castro and his romantic revolution to overthrow the government there, these men in beards wearing army fatigues, representing you know, the youth of Latin America, that was a very new thing indeed. And Fidel Castro, and especially his young prodigy, prodigy Che Guevara, represented a new direction in leftist politics in Latin America. Another thing which inspired um, leftism or, ca or revolution and socialism in Latin America was the way that the United States reacted to it. All across Latin America, many people saw the United States as their enemy, as pursuing naked economic self-interest all across Latin America at the expense of Latin Americans' independence and national patrimony. In fact, the United States had adopted a line of no expropriation of U.S. property in Latin America without full compensation, a, a line which Castro had fully violated. And by embracing communism, Castro had crossed a line that was unacceptable to the United States during the Cold War. Of course, the United States put a trade embargo and suspended the sugar quota immediately, but as I've already mentioned, the, United, the, the, the USSR, the Soviet Union, Russia, picked up the slack. Right? Now, a bigger problem for Cuba was that their infrastructure had been built with American capital, and the Americans hoped to get rid of Castro, but they also hoped to get rid of Castro's influence. Now, getting rid of Castro involved numerous attempts to assassinate the leader. One plot involved the CIA trying to get a poisoned, contaminated diving suit to, um, to Castro so that he would put it on and become poisoned. Other examples involve poisoned or even exploding cigars that Fidel Castro would hopefully smoke. The most notorious example of the United States trying to remove Castro from power was so-called Operation Mongoose. And what this was, was that the United States propaganda started sending out fake messages to Cuba that the end of the world was coming, and that Castro represented the Antichrist, and that when the Cubans saw the fire and the light in the sky, they should rise up in revolution and overthrow Castro. Um, the US, a U.S. submarine shooting off fireworks in the, in the Bay of Havana was supposed to be the signal for this general uprising, but the Cuban people were not fooled. So, unable to remove Castro from power, the United States put pressure on other countries in Latin America to cut their diplomatic relations with Cuba. 
Many of them did, but this could not neutralize Cuba's example, especially not with the people of Latin America who looked up to him as a romantic hero. The United States became involved in training Latin American militias at this point, founding the so-called School of the Americas in 1946, which became dedicated to fighting communism all across Latin America by the early 1960s. Um, they would train the police forces, which would then go back to Latin America and try and repress revolution. The School of the Americas, or the School of the Assassins, as its critics would refer to it, had bases in North Carolina, Georgia, and in the Canal Zone. These training camps became known as the School of the Assassins, since so many of the officers trained there carried out coup d'etats, which removed popularly elected leaders all across Latin America. The goal of the School of the Americas was to make the officer corps in Latin America adverse to revolution and subservient to the United States. That was the stick, but there was also an approach involving the carrot, right? And this was the Alliance for Progress. The Alliance for Progress was you know, was and was an intent was an um, a project on the part of the United States to improve America's re reputation across Latin America. Um, this the the Alliance for Progress was founded shortly after riots greeted um, Vice President Richard Nixon when he toured Venezuela in 1958. People threw tomatoes and accosted the um, car that Nixon was using to tour across Venezuela, demonstrating that it was clear the United States was very unpopular in Latin America. What the Alliance for Progress did was it was supposed to give $20 billion for the development of Latin America, right? The idea was that economic growth, that infrastructure, that by using the, you know, the the, the nicer face of American imperialism, think back to the vaccination campaigns and the campaign to eradicate yellow fever. America had represent, represented imperialism and, you know, gross over involvement in these formerly independent economies across Latin America. But also the United States represented modernity, progress, material comfort, right? And the alliance was supposed to give $20 billion for development in Latin America. And the hope was that as these countries took American money and, you know, developed, grew their economy, made, built infrastructure and made life more comfortable for the people who lived across Latin America, they would become more loyal to the United States. And this would stem the tide of socialist revolution by promoting economic growth. Now, the United States was supposed to spend $20 billion, and this was modeled after the Marshall Plan. Following World War II, the United States had invested heavily in Europe in order to gain their loyalty so that they would not turn towards the Soviet Union. The United States took a similar tack to Latin America through this um, Alliance for Progress, which would spend billions of dollars in Latin America to improve the lives for Latin Americans and make them look to the United States as a, as a benevolent um, benefactor. Now, they were supposed to give $20 billion. They gave almost some, something close to half that amount. Nevertheless, with U.S. money, some countries did actually see progress in the 1960s. And with more money at their disposal, um, reform, democracy, under the guise of capitalism, allowed us, but some countries, especially Chile and Venezuela, to progress. Other countries were complete failures that did not see any economic growth. And the countries that had dictators didn't take the democratic goals of the alliance seriously. But maybe Chile is the most instructive example. Chile had re received quite a bit of money from the United States to help grow its infrastructure, to help build its economy. And in fact, Chile did make progress in the 1960s. But Chileans didn't feel that this progress was coming quickly enough. So they turned to electing a socialist, Salvador Allende, in 1970. So this, so some progress in Chile um, actually brought on a socialist regime because they saw that some the socialist election, I should say, that actually uh, Salvador Allende was democratically elected. This actually hastened um, the arrival of socialism in Chile. Okay, so the United States was spending money to try and help improve Latin America. This was the, this was the intention of the Alliance for Progress. But again, 
the United States never removed the military option from the table. And when Latin American governments lurched leftward, the United States would become militarily involved. For instance, to return to the example of Chile, when Chile elected a socialist in 1970, Salvador Allende, a few years later, the United States actively supported the overthrow of this democratically elected socialist, Salvador Allende, and his replacement with a brutal military dictatorship under the um, leadership of Pinochet. In any case, the United States never did move, remove the military option from the table. And the United States, despite the fact that they tried to spend money to improve conditions in Latin America, couldn't help but show its true face on more than one occasion. In 1965, for instance, the Dominican Republic got its first democratically elected president after Trujillo, a man named Juan Bosch. Juan Bosch was no radical. He did, however, attempt to implement modern, sorry, moderate agricultural reform and to build up labor unions. But the United States thought that he went too far towards the left, so they oversaw his overthrow by the rightist military dictator Donald Reed Cabral. And the United States dispatched Marines to the Dominican Republic to prevent the overthrow of this newly, newly installed president by supporters of the former president and reformist Juan Bosch. So as much as the United States promised to spend money and to promote democracy across Latin America, the fact that they continued to support dictators who were um, pro-U.S. showed that they were not so committed to democracy as they professed that they were. 